So you, you will begin to see this slide, this particular slide, many times in the future. Because this, we think, represents very well what ArcGIS is. Traditionally, it was this. This was the traditional GIS. A GIS on someone's desk and with local data. But now, of course, this person can connect to enterprise data sources, databases in different places in the organization, or to what is called the cloud, services and information which is on the internet somewhere. And we don't know where, but it is accessible. Someone who is using a mobile device can also access this data, or this data, or this data. Someone who accesses the web without any other GIS software can access also these different data sources. Now traditionally, as I showed before, we were creating, managing, visualizing, and analyzing geographic information. But now more and more, we are discovering, because all of these can search and can find the information much more easily, and, much, and, and more importantly, now we are collaborating. So within an office, individuals can collaborate. Within a university, departments can collaborate. And then, of course, globally, we can collaborate. We can publish, we can publish our data to the cloud. And someone else, immediately from their cell phone, from their iPhone, can get access to that data. Or someone from the street can publish something. And we can get access to it from somewhere else. So now there are many different combinations or permutations. And so this is a new view of GIS. And you'll probably hear people maybe who don't work for Esri, saying, well, GIS is old technology, and then there are all these new wonderful things. Well, yes, we agree, there are all these new wonderful things. It's all part of GIS. So GIS has evolved and it has grown. Perhaps one of the most important messages for the university, here or in any country, is that there are many universities utilizing GIS software normally only for academic instruction. So there is a little bit of GIS software in a geography department, and it's being used to train 20 geographers. Or there's another laboratory that has 15 licenses for 15 biologists. That's not a very efficient way to manage software. And that's not the way that the university manages its Microsoft software, or its Oracle software, or its Novell software, which is institutionally and as enterprise software. So when we, when we see GIS as enterprise software and we manage the software at the university level, then it can be utilized by many different departments, but more interestingly, more interestingly, it can be used for all these different administrative uses. And so one of our big messages for the universities is the GIS is not just for teaching, it's for the university to save money, to be more efficient, to be more safe. Demographic analysis, where are the students? Where are the new students in five years? Um, boundary planning, our campus is growing and we need to acquire new land. Where are we going to grow? What's the best, what's the best, uh, the best plan? Safety and preparedness. Nearly all campuses, university campuses in the world now are thinking about having a safety plan. Evacuation, transportation, some of them in, uh, even have three-dimensional models of every building. And they know this is the way into the building, this is the way out of the building. So you can do that with GIS. Logistics, all of the vehicles that are moving people and, and, and cargo around the campus. Internet mapping. Many universities still do not have a good campus map on the internet. And when I say a good campus map, I don't mean a PDF. I mean a live map which allows me, a visitor, to go to the University of Sao Paulo and, 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 and to learn where is the visitor parking? And where is the university um, storage facility? And where is the biology department? And where are the dormitories? And et cetera. Okay? So it's a good opportunity to start applying GIS for the business of the university. And here are just a few examples and safety preparedness. There are different applications, different things that you can do to take the standard GIS 
and create special applications for evacuation routes, for example, or facilities management. Where are the buildings? Where are the vehicles? Where are the, the, the different uh, pieces of investment? IT integration to, 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 to better connect the GIS to the rest of the IT infrastructure. The IT infrastructure which is utilized for planning new buildings and for maintenance, for example. Next. So one of the keys, of course, and we'll hear more about this, one of the keys is what's called the educational site license. So this is the idea of treating GIS as an enterprise software. And forgetting about having a little bit of GIS here and a little bit of GIS there with separate licenses and separate administration. That's not efficient. And it's confusing. And people don't talk to each other. When we treat GIS as an enterprise software, then we have a single point of contact. And I'll show you some examples. Perhaps it's the library which controls the software. Perhaps it's the IT department. Perhaps it's the geography department. But some particular department manages software for everyone on campus. And this is interesting for multidisciplinary projects. So we have a biologist who wants to work with a geographer. But the biologist says, well, I don't have GIS software. It's in the geography laboratory. This is silly. With the, with the, with the university or the educational site license, anyone can experiment with GIS. So any biologist or any, any, anyone on campus can say, I think I would like to try GIS, but I don't want to enter in a contract and buy 20 GIS licenses and install the software and maintain the software. I would like to experiment. And so this allows anyone on the campus to use the software. Yes, next. One of the things that GIS software allows the professor to provide is a type of education which is focused on solving problems. And of course, it's a big problem everywhere in the world that our students are studying a lot of books and they're taking lots of examinations, but they're not really working on solving problems. And then what happens? Then these students who have excellent marks, they have excellent grades, they go to a business and the business says, okay, that's paper, but we have to solve problems in the, here in the business. We have to build bridges. We have to fight fires. We have to solve crimes. JS allows our students to solve problems and to work together collaboratively. And this was a survey, some questions that were asked of businesses. And they asked the businesses, essentially, what do you want your students to know? What skills should the students have? And very high on the list is critical thinking and analytical reasoning skills, solving problems and asking questions. The ability to apply knowledge to real world settings through hands-on experience, really touching things and projects. So these are very, very high on the list of what employers are looking for. So GIS provides the opportunity for a little bit of GIS in biology, in mathematics, in geography, in planning, in environmental sciences, for the students to work on projects. So this sort of theme or the idea of GIS across the campus is something which is happening in many places. And we have identified 100 disciplines across the many universities around the world where they are either teaching with GIS or researching with GIS. Many, many disciplines, strange disciplines. You would be surprised. And this is because everyone works and lives in space. So perhaps one of the problems we have had historically is that we have a big G here, geographic. And the biologist has said, that's not for me. And the industrial engineer has said, that's not for me. That's for geographers. Okay, That's a problem for us. Because we know that everyone lives and works in space and has problems to solve in space. So now we have more than 6,000 universities that are using ESRI software around the world. And more, more than 600 of the top universities, the universities that are, have become leaders, they have adopted these site licenses because they see that GIS is for everyone and it's for saving money, being more efficient, solving problems. Next. So here's just a small example of the different disciplines 
So for example, civil engineering, people who are building roads and ports and bridges and that sort of thing. Next. Um, we work very closely with something called the Institute for Technology in Liberal Education. Liberal education are these small universities, small colleges, that are teaching philosophy, languages, um, things that are not technical. However, these universities have decided, but we also want to use technology. And so they have gotten together, they've created a consortium, and Esri works directly with these universities to also provide these small liberal arts universities with GIS. Next. History, for example. There are many, many history professors who are utilizing GIS for their research. And they're teaching utilizing GIS. And I think you can imagine how anything that's being taught in history can utilize maps and can show changes over time. That's one of the, that's one of the, the major themes of GIS. How do things change over time? And why do things change over time? So historians are utilizing GIS in many, many places. Thanks.